Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Tilly, for those who might not recognize me, especially behind the mask. <laughs> um, and I'm the program and research librarian with the Orange Hill Public Library. So local author, prolific writer, editor, and book coach, Diane Bader, was born a storyteller. And once she started writing, she never looked back. And boy, did she never look back. <laughs> So we have proudly showcased Diane's work here at the library for many years now. She is a member of the Crime Writers of Canada and more locally participates in our own Headwaters Writers Guild. Diane is the author of many cozy mystery novels and series. Tonight, Diane is going to speak to us about writing, publishing, and we'll chat about not one, but two of the books that she has published in 2021. <gasps> So those books are Dead Without Remorse, book five in the Gilda Wright mystery series, and All That Shines, the second book in the Glitter Bay mystery series. So I'll turn it over to you, Diane. Thank you. Okay. Now it's time for the unveiling. Whew, I can talk better this way. Yeah, I've been writing cozy mysteries now. Um, this one here. I know, I'm going off camera. Uh, murder on Manitou is actually my very first murder mystery. And I had never thought about writing murder mysteries before. Even though I read them voraciously, I do puzzles all the time, I do all these things that involve mystery. Why on earth I never thought I could write one was beyond me. This one was actually through a small publisher up in North Bay. And they started off with the premise that you write a chapter and it's based on a murder mystery party game. So you write one chapter from the point of view of each different character, which that is a challenge. <laughs> and trying to have all your characters sound different and carry the story along was just really fascinating for me. And then I won the contest and the book was published and I went, what am I doing with all this other writing stuff? So everything that I had been working on either went on the shelf or became a mystery. So <laughs> there was no way out. Um, so here we are, 2021. Um, my second or my 11th and 12th novels just came out this year. Um, I don't have Dead Without Remorse here with us because I don't have copies yet, <laughs> but they will be coming in the next couple of months, so that's not a problem. Everything you see on there is available here to borrow at the library, or you can go to Book Lore, they have copies there as well. Uh, why I got into cozy mysteries, cozy mysteries are a little more small town, a little more, you know, small, um, amateur detective who's kind of got a reason for solving the mystery or is just basically very nosy and just has to get their nose into everything. So pretty much all of my series so far, sorry, I'm just gonna move these papers on my way. Um, all of my books so far feature uh, small town sleuths. Um, Gilda Wright, <laughs> And part of what I was going to talk tonight about was the one piece of advice people give you when you're starting out writing. And the one thing they always tell you is write what you know. And if people just kind of go, I don't know anything. Or who's going to want to read about my life? And when I started doing cozy mysteries, <laughs> that kind of became what I knew. There's small towns. I'm a little nosy. <laughs> um, and it was a good way for me when I started to do um, The Bookstore Lady, was my very first novel. I had just moved to Orangeville. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know the town at all. And it seemed like a really good way for both me and my character to kind of get to know things was for me walking around town and seeing all these really neat things. One thing that totally captivated me was the tree sculptures. The other thing that totally got me was Boca Berry, which makes an appearance in that whole series, and Book Lore, which <laughs> book one, um, the main character actually buys a small bookstore, and it is based on Book Lore. 
which Nancy Frader just went, really? <laughs> That's so cool. Um, and I had a lot of fun with that because it, as I was writing the book and as I was walking around town, more things would go into the book that I came across downtown. No murders. I didn't hurt anybody, I promise. I was not on the run from the mafia, I promise. Um, and then further into this series, you know, other characters come along, they have kids, things like that happen. And bits of my life, what I knew, went into the book. So when people talk about write what you know, it's not necessarily, you know, what job do you do? What, you know, what this, what that, what, you know, a lot of it for me is things like, I know what it smells like when I walk outside in the autumn and you can smell the earthiness and the decaying leaves. You can get that little bit of a cool breeze on your face. Those are the things that you want to put in your book. Those are the things that just bring your reader into your world. So going back to the cozy mystery thing, those are the things I would pop into those books. Because as I'm walking, you know, you're crunching the leaves under your feet, that sort of thing. When you're writing cozy mysteries or any kind of mystery, your main genre is your mystery romances, those kind of things, those can come in there, no problem. But those are secondary, and you kind of keep those in the background. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here too. <laughs> I have all these little notes, and I'm just gonna go, meh. One of my favorite, favorite things, and why writing what you know has always come back to me again and again, was years ago, I received this book. It's called Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg. And if you were interested in writing anything, this is a great resource to have. She's very encouraging. She can be discouraging because she sits there and goes, well, I'm going to write about a zucchini today. <laughs> you sit there and go, oh, a zucchini, really? But then she shows you the poem she wrote, and you just kind of go, oh, okay, that works. But the one thing she wrote that has stuck with me from the very, very first time I ever picked up this book, which is now dog-eared and covered in highlighter and all kinds of great things. This section is called Living Twice, which is what all writers do. Writers live twice. They go along with their regular life and are as fast as anyone in the grocery store crossing the street getting dressed for work in the morning. But there's another part of them that they've been training, the one that lives everything a second time, that sits down and sees their life again and goes over it, looks at the texture and the details. And that's the part that writes what they know. I had a lot of fun this past year um, working on the two books that are up there, All That Sparkles and All That Shines. They kind of became a um, pet project, I guess. All That Sparkles started off with, <clears throat> all that, sorry, All That Sparkles started off with um, a young woman who runs a secondhand boutique and her sister, who is a former model, has come to town and totally upends her life. They end up buying a, a new building and in book two, all that shines. This new building has become completely renovated. They, her sister brings in a fashion designer from LA and all of the things that come with him, all of his furnishings from his design shops and all of that stuff. And the poor sister who has owned this consignment shop is going, well, what do I do with all these people and all these things? Like, this, this town's not big enough for all of us. But who she does meet is one of my very favorite characters so far. Um, the young man comes in and is introduced as Hamlet. And she's like, Hamlet, your parents didn't like you. Like, what's going on? And she kind of has this weird thing with him that they just kind of look at each other and walk the other way. But Hamlet one day after 
his good friend is murdered, comes clean with Lakin and Sage, who are the girls who run the shop. And he sits them down and says, I'm not what I seem. I'm not Hamlet. My name is Quinn and I'm a woman. And I can t I have been in that position. <laughs> and I can tell you very honestly, the girls did exactly what I did. Oh, okay. So now what? And they take him in, take her in, sorry. They take her in under their wings and she has become a big part of the boutique now. And book three and four are already in the works up here. <laughs> And she is going to be so much fun to work with. I'm already having a blast. And there was actually a person who inspired that character. And I have talked about it ad nauseum. And she knows who she is because we chat all the time. And she has an autographed copy of the book as well. And that was how I met her. She walked, I work at the theater. And she walked in one day to buy a ticket. And I asked for her name. And she told me. And I went, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to say, you know, that's the world we live in, right? Everybody's open. Everybody's upfront about things. And it just took me that second to go, oh, okay, it registered. Let's go on. And I really hope that that's what readers take away when they meet Quinn, because she's just fabulous. She's a lot of fun. Uh, does anybody have any questions before I keep rambling? Yes. When did you start writing? I oh. am how long ago oh my goodness i have always been a writer always since i was little i would tell stories and talk and <laughs> my very first book was the bookstore lady and i believe it was 2012 that it was published and that was fun too because when i wrote that book and i tried to pitch it to publishers and agents and i was getting nowhere and i actually ended up becoming part of an online critique group and one of the women in the group i really liked how she commented on things and how she noticed things that other people were were missing so i asked her privately would you read this and tell me like you know what do i need to fix so she gave me a big long list and she told me once you fix all those things send it to this lady her name is dawn and she's, she would be interested in reading it. And I'm like, why am I going to send this to somebody else, right? And then I did some research and found out this woman was an agent. So I got my first agent, which I don't have anymore, but that's another story. Um, but I got my first agent that way, which was terrific. And she and I worked together for quite a while and get, got the story up to speed to where we were both happy did some pitching around to different publishers and stuff. And I ended up working with a Canadian publisher out in, at that point they were in uh, just north of Calgary. So here we are, we've got a Canadian publisher, an American agent and the little Canadian writer. And my American agent went, this is a lot of math. <laughs> I don't think I can do this. So she actually stepped out of the equation and I've been working directly with the publisher ever since. So all of the books that are here now are with Books We Love Publishing and uh, our fearless leader has now moved out to Vancouver, but she still runs the show, which is terrific. And they're, they've been really good to us all. So. And we, the company has grown huge. So that's been really cool is watching more and more authors come in and the timelines get a little bit more, oh, <laughs> we're already looking for 2023 now. Anybody got a book you want to? I can't even think that far ahead right now. <laughs> Anybody else, another question? Yeah. Are there any books for sale today? I do have a few books for sale here today. We can pull some of those out later. Um, I don't have all of them because that was a big box and I didn't want to carry it. <laughs> So one of the great things about COVID, and I, not many people say this, but there were some great things about COVID and everything. Um, we had our very last in-person session with the um, Crime Writers of Canada in 
Tottenham on March 7th. And it was like two weeks later and all of a sudden we're all at home going, whoa, that was fast. We all keep in touch, which is very cool. But ever since then, all of the meetings with all of these organizations I belong to and all of these writing groups, we've gone online. And it's been a lot of fun because some of us are from all across Canada. Some of us are from all around the world. And it's very neat to get to meet people in that kind of format that you can see them, you can hear them, you can share ideas, you can share your work, but you'll, you're not gonna bump into them down the street because they live in Germany <laughs> or they live in Australia. And it's been really cool. It's made my world so much smaller. And the really neat part for me was uh, on the weekend actually, one of the groups I write, I've been writing with for the last year is based in Newmarket, but we're all over Ontario. And a lot of us actually did um, a farmer's market on Saturday. And it, it wasn't like the biggest, greatest event in the world, but I got to meet all these people in person, which was just so cool. After, for a year, being back and forth on Zoom chats all the time, twice a week, and it was just so neat. <laughs> And they've learned a lot. I've been able to take some really incredible webinars and writing courses and, and doing my book coaching course, which I'm waiting to hear if I got my certification yet. But even that was just so neat to connect with people from all over the place. We have writers, we have coaches in Ireland and, you know, just everywhere. It's very cool. I think one of my favorite books that I've written has to be um, All That Shines. And a big part of that is writing Quinn. One of my favorite lines is on this page. And Quinn has, her former boss has been killed and the girls, everybody's kind of upset. And Sage asks Quinn, are you okay? Like, you know, is there something we can do for you? And Quinn just looks at her and says, darling, I sat in the teeny tiny hotel bathroom last night with two bottles of Chardonnay and a cheesecake. I'm bloated, my eyes hurt, but I need to carry on and mourn him in my own way. Is that okay with you? So that was my favorite. <laughs> Writing cozy mysteries is kind of fun. You get to put in people you know, but you can disguise them so they don't know. You can kill them if you want. You, there's no repercussions for that, not in a book. <laughs> and I have had people go, was that me? No. Nope. <laughs> in the bookstore lady, there was a great, there's a, one group of people that I had a lot of fun with, and it's a local writing group. Belonging to the Headwaters writing group here, of course, everybody went, is that me? Was that one me? Did I do that? No. <laughs> but a lot of my characters are not based on a single person. So I will do maybe traits from one person and add a voice from another person or add a limp from somebody else or, you know, totally mesh them all up. So it's not just one person, except for one case. Because the person that I wrote about actually won a contest to be in the book. <laughs> and Sonia's here tonight. <laughs> and she actually makes an appearance. <laughs> she actually makes an appearance in one of the Gilda Wright books. Gilda Wright kind of got started because I was working. Gilda Wright is a receptionist at a karate school. I was working as a receptionist in a karate school. And there were just all those fun little things that you're like, oh, I would just like to. But I didn't. I just wrote it down. I was nice. Uh, except for sparring, and that's fair game. Um, I actually do have a blue belt in Goju karate. So, so I, I did practice what I preached. Um, I haven't been able to do it for years now, but that's, you know, that's the way life goes sometimes. Um, I've had a lot of fun with Gilda because when we first started with the Gilda books, she had been through a horrible breakup. 
She was infatuated with her boss, who she started to date. And she has grown over the last few books and will continue to grow in the next couple of books. So it's, it's been a lot of fun for me watching this woman who really doesn't have the self-confidence or the courage to think that you know, she can really go out there and do anything on her own. She just kind of hides behind her desk, kind of like me here. <laughs> she just kind of hides behind her desk at work and does what everybody expects of her. And then she stumbles across a body. And slowly she has to start thinking out of the box. You know, who would do this? Why would they do it? Well, we can see how they did it because that's a pretty big sword. But she has to really stop and think who to trust and who to talk to and how to figure things out. And growing up with her, her father as a police officer, she's already got that little brain ticking away in there. So I've been having a good time with her and she, just when you think things are going nice and smooth, you know, her love life is going nice and smooth, and then she meets a whole new character who just throws everything off kilter. And that's the way series go. <laughs> you, know, you can't have it going straight all along. I've read a couple of series where people have dragged it and dragged it and dragged it and dragged it and I got to the point that I don't even care who this character falls in love with anymore because we're 20 books in. Like, <laughs> I've invested half my life in this series. So, you know, it is fun though to be able to just kind of throw hurdles in their way. When, you're, when your story's ticking along and everything's going really nice and smooth and you're like, wait, where's the mystery in that? So you gotta throw them a curveball. You know, they break an ankle or their best friend gets pushed into the ocean off a boat or something. So I see a hand. Darla. Diane, I was wondering, you, you're mentioning that, that it's fun and I imagine uh, <clears throat> like doing what you're doing, but, but are there times when it's a chore? When, when, it's, when it doesn't come easy, when it's not fun? Are there times when it's a chore? <laughs> Editing, <laughs> one word. Um, I don't know, even editing, I, I actually like editing. I don't say that out loud too much because people get kind of upset. Um, the only time I find it's very stressful is when you're trying to pitch a book. And I'm with, my publisher right now, I have that luxury of, I can pretty much send them what I want and they're totally happy. But I have a couple other books on the back burner right now that I am eventually doing the edits on, excuse me, so that I can start pitching them to either agents or a bigger publisher. That's stressful <laughs> because getting your query letters just right, getting your synopsis just right, um, it's just one of those things that I hate to do because you have to be so finicky and so tight with it. I've been lucky with the book coaching part of it that I've met people and that's what we are training to do is help walk authors through that process. So I'm getting better at doing that part of it, but it's nice that I have extra people to go, Hey, okay, I'm at the end of my rope. Can you read this? Let me know if this makes sense because I think I'm missing half my book in here. Other than that though, yeah, I, the editing part of it for me even, I kind of enjoy that part. It's fun to go back and say, oh, I missed that line, that's funny. Or uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. So. What kind of authors do you read? What authors do I read? <laughs> Um, <laughs> right now I haven't been reading a whole lot of stuff. Um, for my coaching stuff, I've been reading a lot of nonfiction and I'm actually, one of my projects right now is writing a, a writing book, which is nonfiction. Um, I have been reading, what was the book I just read? Life is Not Yoga by Jackie Burnett, who is a new writer and I believe she I can't remember. I think she's in San Francisco now. But 
through my blog, which I've been doing a blog for many, many years. And at one point I was going to shut it down because I just did not have time to do anything with it. And then one day I had this thought, I'm like, you know, if I'm not gonna use it, why don't I use it to help other authors? So it became Escape with a Writer. I would do it every Sunday. And, you know, I'd hopefully find a few writers to promote because, you know, it's... Um, I started it in September 2018. By Christmas, I had authors right up until April. And I went, I need to add another day. So I added a Wednesday. And that went on through until this past, this spring, April, May. And I had someone reach out to me and he is a book, he is a promoter. And I'm like, well, what's he want with me? And he's looking for blogs to help promote the books that he promotes. So now my blog has gone from one Sunday, you know, every Sunday. I now do it three days a week because I am full. At this point, I'm full into November. And still trying to find, I still have to find a couple more authors that I have to reach out to, but it's so much fun for me. It, it is a lot of work sometimes, but I have met authors literally all over the world. I've promoted authors from Germany, Hungary, um, the UK, Australia, you name it. And a lot of them become my friends on Facebook or we keep in touch. And some of them that I've promoted are local and we keep in touch as well. And you know, we'll share each other's work, we'll help promote each other. So that part's been a lot of fun. Just and some of them are like, well, here, while you're at it, here's a free copy of my book. <laughs> so I get a lot of books to read. <laughs> so sometimes I'll just pull one out and sometimes it's really, the, the one I just mentioned um, about the Life Is Not Yoga was a fabulous book. Absolutely just blew my mind. I have read other books, not so much. And I don't want to discourage people. I want to help them as much as I can. Other authors, I love helping other authors, which is why I'm doing the book coach thing, which is why I do the blog. And I have no problem with, you know, answering questions from people, you know, any way that I can help support them. I'm happy to do so. So anybody else have another question? Charlie. Um, I was just wondering when you are writing about specific people, like in that are in real life in your books, have you ever had to like blur the line so you didn't get in any sort of trouble? And if you did, how far did you have to push it? <laughs> um, I can't say. Don't just kidding. Um, not, there's always a way around things. Like, I mean, if you're writing about something very specific or a person very specifically, you can still blur that line enough, you know, make them, if it's a woman, make it a man, or if it's, you know, just, you can describe them differently or the setting differently, or, you know, kind of leave out clues that people will go, hey, that's me. Although people still will do that, whether it is or not. <laughs> I, I have, uh, my Gilda books, I have two, I have a sensei in there, and at the time I wrote them, I had two senseis in real life. I think the debate still lives on about who is the main character. I won't tell because it's neither of them really, but they have fun with it. So, anybody else? Yeah. Do you, um, and you kind of said that you put up some of yourself into your characters, but does your character ever come out in anything you do? Something like, has your, have your characters changed the way you look at things or think about things? I think so, yeah. You know, they're writing, I mean, a lot of people, when they're, you're going through struggles and whatever, you end up writing a journal. And sometimes those journals, things will come out in your journals, and there will be things that, in my books, kind of become my journals sometimes. So things that are in me will come out in the journal and I'll have that reflected back and go, oh, 
I did not see that coming. <laughs> and, and it plays great in the story as well, but it also gives you time to sit and reflect and go, oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't see it that way, but now that I'm seeing it reflected in the character, now it's coming back at me and I'm like, oh, that's what I was seeing, but I didn't see it. Do we have any other writers in here? I just started doing it last. I started it uh, when I got ill eight years ago. Oh. I sort of, because I was given like three months to live, it's eight years now. Wow. And it's like inspired me to, when I'm with people, I tend to inspire them. So I thought, why can't I write what I feel and how? That's why I want to get that book that you showed there. Absolutely. So many people give me ideas. I have cousins that are writers, and they say, you can do it. You, you inspire people, but how do you get it together? Because at the journal, I have my whole life. Right. And so you have all these things, but you don't have to get it together. That's like tricky. It, it is, and especially if you're doing something more personal like that. It's different if you're doing fiction when you kind of have a beginning, a middle, and an ending. Yeah, this is totally... Yes and no, because you still have a starting point where you were before you got ill or when you found out and how you progress through it. And it's amazing how many people... And I, I get the same thing. Like, I've talked to people and we sit and have big long conversations about life and writing and everything and I get the same thing like you're inspiring like why aren't you writing this stuff and I'm like well because I don't want to write that stuff that's that's this stuff and nobody wants to see that but when you have a great story to tell same thing you have a beginning a middle the end you have all of these key things that have happened to you that you want to share, the things that will help your reader in their own life and their own struggles. So if this happened, how did you cope with this? How, what did you think? And you always go to kind of your climax of your own book will be that really dark point in your life. And everybody's had one that you go through and you hit that point where I can't do this anymore. Well, why is it so easy to like when I went to hospice, people would think I was the, I wasn't the sick one. Yeah. Because <laughs> I would talk and I'd cheer people up and I'd joke. And so it's easier for me to talk about it and, and tell people, but to write it, it's hard. So record yourself. That's so what someone said. Yeah. But I find it hard. Well, I, I know, I hate listening you know, to myself on recording. <laughs> right? So she says it was me, with my operation. My voice has totally changed. Or there are programs yeah, that you can get. Talk. I was told I never talk together. I never use this arm. Well, I said, you won't shut me up. <laughs> and I think they'll shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> there are actually programs that you can get online that are either really cheap or free that you can talk to it and it will dictate. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was just Googling that today, okay. believe it or not. So. I, there are programs you can pay money for, which are supposed to be really good. But if you want to just sit and talk to your computer, you can find, I think Google has one. There's a couple different ones, programs that they have that are free. You can talk to your computer, tell it your story, and then you can go through it and play with the words later. They, you know, you can clean it up. But you can do it if you don't want to sit and write it, if you find that a struggle. I try it, it's just not, I get little parts here, little parts. I guess it's because I don't know how to put it together. Well, and that's it, like, your whole life, really, is a whole bunch of little stories all pieced together. And it's to get it together. That's it. So if you want to sit down and tell it to your computer, your computer is a good listener. Yeah. Well, sometimes. They don't always cooperate, but they listen. Um, <laughs> But that would be the best thing for you, I think, is to get one of those programs, download it, and just talk to your computer, just like, you know, get poured a cup of coffee. Sometimes when you want to talk more than other times. So yeah. So in the middle of the night, you get up and you just want to start. Yeah. Exactly, and you don't have to disturb somebody to write it down for you. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'll buy that book, definitely, I need to. For sure. 
So I think we've just seen a little bit of what I, I, I picture your book coaching would be. Um, is that, uh, like what would a person come to a book coach with? Like stuff already written? Stuff, I kind of want to be a writer, how do I do it? Or would it be a mix of all of those? Mix of all of the above. Um, I've worked with one person who he has an idea and he started to write it, but he doesn't know where it's going or what the books, he sort of knows what it's about, but not really. And I've worked with somebody, uh, we have to do certain practicum levels to actually apply for our certification. The last woman I worked with was somebody I met right before COVID actually. And she had put out her first book and now she had her second and it was written and she was just in the process of submitting it to agents. And just as we're working together, she got an agent. So we've been working on it, smoothing it over, making it, um, doing all the changes that the agents wanted. And she is beside herself because she's like, this is all new. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like, you're good, just breathe, right? That's all you can keep doing, just keep breathing. Um, and now the other day, I just got a message from her and she's going, we're in negotiations for film rights. <laughs> so I'm just like, okay, <laughs> that one's new for me, but this is good, let's keep going. So, so it's been a lot of fun and I really can't wait to see her book come out because it's really great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it has come a long way, even from the first draft I read to what she's going to be submitting to publishers is just, amazing so and then the other author I worked with for my practicum was somewhere in the middle her book was done but she knows she wants to self-publish so we didn't have that pressure of queries and synopsis and all of that and we get to do these you know I get to go through all of their fun stuff <laughs> and go wow these are really cool ideas and then we do a zoom meeting and just talk about what could what could be changed? What could be tweaked to make things stronger? Um, what could make it a better story? Um, one of the writers I've worked with has a great thing with ellipses, the little dot, dot, dot. If you've ever seen Mamma Mia and there's that one scene where they're going dot, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think they took her dots. Anybody else? My question is, you're writing books, okay? A lot of things go through your head. Mm -hmm. How do you find it sleeping at night? <laughs> <laughs> I have become very good at making a lot of notes. Um, I always keep a little notepad and a pen beside my bed. I have been known to scare my cat senseless at about 2 a.m. going, I got it, I figured it out. And the cats just kind of go flying. But. Um, I have behind my desk a whole bunch of binders and it doesn't matter what I'm working on for books there's always ideas for other books they just creep up on you and you just kind of swat them off but the easiest way I do it is just make notes and stick them in the binder for later on how I sleep at night well that depends on what I'm working on <laughs> You know, if I'm really, if I have a deadline, I'm working really intensely on something, then it will be going through my head nonstop all the time. And I will, I've been known to make notes on napkins, on Kleenex, on paper, on receipts, on, you know, you name it. Kids' homework, they didn't like that. Um, it just depends what I'm doing and how absorbed in it I am. I'm sorry, you had a question as well? Um, I've been doing like journaling and it's like um, life in the 50s. You know, it was after the war and like we were very poor and just all the different stuff that happened in a tenement, you know, stuff like that. But I don't know how to go about what would be the next step for me. You know, I've just got it all written down, but I don't really know what else to do with it. So what is the story that you want to tell with it? Just about growing up in the 50s. Just about growing up in the 50s and what life was like. Do you have kind of a, a beginning point that might be something that would get, like, do you want to write just about your life in general or are you writing? 
About other people's life as well. Just about other people's life as well. As my own. Okay. I mean, writing those kind of things is great. Um, it's hard, like, if you ever wanted to publish or anything, those are things that you would probably lean more to self publish because a publisher will look for more of the story behind the story. Okay. So if you have a character who is growing up in the 50s who is going through adolescence and what how their life changes from one day they're you know an eight-year-old kid to all of a sudden they're 14 and they have to go get a job because this has happened or that's happened mm -hmm. you know you want to bring up the story part of it not just the day-to-day -day. you just give it a little bit of drama it's it's that whole thing of write what you know but just give it a little kick and just kind of make it a little a little more exciting, shall we say. Well, I have a good sense of humor, so. There you go. Just bring that sense of humor in there. Okay. For sure. Okay. And I would suggest to do a lot of reading, biographies and stuff, and see how they do it. Okay. That's one of the things I was told years ago, too, is when you find a genre or you find something you really like, even if you just don't do it with a library book, please. No. Take a pen, highlighter, make notes, not with the library books. I will get in trouble. They know where to find me. So, <laughs> so when I got started with my very first book, um, I, was, I was kind of in a, a good spot to do it. <laughs> I just moved to town. Uh, my kids, I could walk my kids to school, drop them off, and just keep walking. I had to come back, but, you know. <laughs> but I would walk around town, and I would end up at Mocha Berry, or at the time, Coffee House was still there. And I would sit down, and I would have half an hour, do some writing, and then I'd have to go pick up the kindergarten kid, which worked out great because I got a lot done. One of the things I found that really did help with my ability to tell the stories and to actually get some writing done some days was I joined a writing group. And we had the Headwaters Writers Guild that eventually will get back to meeting here. And it was just really great to have a group that you can sit down. And the way we do it is you sit down, you set the timer, and you write for 15 minutes um, using a prompt and whoever was the leader that day would have a list of prompts have actually written prompts or they would bring, okay, tell me about the mask. No, don't. Um, and you would just write for 15 minutes about whatever the prompt was that you got that day. I've also been doing other writing groups online right now and we don't use prompts and we don't write the same things, which is really kind of neat too. We get online, we talk, go figure. We talk for 15 minutes and then cameras go off. You still hear the other, or you can still hear or see or whatever, but um, you work on your own projects for 45 minutes. And we've been doing that now twice a week for almost a year or for a year. Yeah, it's for a year now. And that is how two books in a year came to be because I had that dedicated time every week to sit down. I'm responsible for being at that meeting with those people on that day, at that time. What are you working on today? And sometimes you want to tell them and sometimes you're like, I'm editing. But it's always great just to have that group of people that you see once a week or however often. In our case with the writers group here, we would meet every couple of weeks on a Sunday, which was great. In the case with the online group, we meet Sunday mornings and Monday nights. And I had another group up until I was back in the office that I was meeting on Mondays as well. So my Mondays were like, I'm writing all day. It felt good. I got a lot done. <laughs> So how about, we have a couple of writers in the group. Um, do you have a routine for your own writing? Um, normally, like uh, when I wrote uh, my first book, 
book. It was I kind of wrote it all in one go. So it was it was a friend. I would sit there for eight or nine hours until my hands cramped up and just <laughs> wrote and wrote and wrote. Other times I heard it was uh, it was an interview with uh, I think it was Freddie Mercury. And he was saying if they were writing a song and they felt it just they were forcing it, they would just stop. It yeah. was their best work. They said all their chart toppers were just done and it just flowed and flowed. So if I feel I'm ever like just kind of just at a dead end or I'm feeling just a little frustrated or just like not writer's block, but just like enforcing it, I'll just stop for a little bit. Um, I started writing a bit of the second one in the same there's, uh, there's two of them, so I started writing a bit of the second one and that sort of happened. And then, so I kind of went on hiatus for a little bit. Started doing some more editing on the first one, but I don't like editing either. <laughs> and then uh, I got an idea for a new book that's totally, like, totally opposite. I'm under opposite fields, 100% different. Like, I wouldn't even, it's so different. I wouldn't even really want to associate it with the first one, but I just feel like whenever I get a chance to, like uh, like always right in front of the TV and stuff, sometimes you just yep. gotta, you just gotta sit yourself down and do it. Um, it's fun having cool toys to do it with too. So <laughs> I just did mine all like pen and paper, just just wrote it all down. Yeah. But uh, I looked into different tablets that kind of time city and things like that so I can write everything down on my tablet and then I just email it to myself and it's yeah. right there. Yeah. So that like those little those little things they help. I used to just sit down with a coffee and Mokaberry too. <laughs> <laughs> Mokaberry is a popular spot for writers. <laughs> yeah, just put like, the horse blinders on just kind of get going. Yeah. Uh, the more I read too the more I write. Absolutely. So, yeah. But it works real crazy real I don't really have a routine. I kind of just sit down. Some some days I'll be able to write like a couple paragraphs, and it's okay. I can't do this. Other days it's I'm trying to find time to write because I've been writing so much. It's like I just want to get home. Yeah. Because I got 15 pages lined up in my head, and I have to get them down before I forget it, or before the story changes. So <laughs> I just find as long as you just keep writing, just don't stop. That's exactly it. I know I do a lot of my writing with pen and paper and because, and uh, it was a friend of ours from the writing group that actually said it, that your thoughts flow better from your head through your heart and down your hand. And I find if I'm typing things or editing things and I'm getting stuck, I will just turn off the computer, sit down with a pen and paper and go, what needs to be in that spot? And sometimes it comes right away. Sometimes it takes going out for a walk and then having no pen and paper when it comes into your head, which is frustrating. <laughs> and there are a lot of days because I walk to work all the time too. I will be halfway to work going, oh, got it. Okay, now I gotta walk faster. <laughs> and by the time I get there, well, part of it's still there. So it, it, enough that I can grab and write down and I'll get back to it later. But. And one of the other things that somebody had mentioned one time, um, when you're writing and writing and writing and everything's flowing and going great and then you get to this one scene and you're like, I just can't write that scene. It's just not there or I can't do it justice right now or I get it go. <laughs> we use placeholders. Put a little line that says, oh, this is the fight scene. And you just leave the little placeholder in the middle of nowhere, leave a little gap, and come back to it later. And it, at first there was a couple of people, when I told them that, they're like looking at me going, what do you mean? It's like, well, if you're not going to sit down and sit down, you know, sit down and work that out right now, by all means, just put a little note, come back to it later when you're fresh or when you have an idea for that spot, and fill it in. Nobody says you have to start at A and write A, B, C, D. All of my books were written in different writing groups, in different workshops. I have A over to M, over to you know Z down here somewhere, back over to B. 
and then you put it all together. Just like you ladies are saying, trying to get things structured and organized, sometimes it just doesn't come out in a linear fashion. Sometimes you just have to kind of go, we'll shuffle the deck together once it's written. And you can get that whole story down there. You can get all of your plot points, your ideas. I know people, I'm one of them. I'm not an outliner. I'm not one of those people that can sit down and go, okay, well, this is going to happen. And then this will happen. And then this will happen. By the time I get to three, I'm already going, oh, I'm over here doing this. Oh yeah, I got to come back to my outline. I prefer doing the writing part. And after a chapter, then I'll do, add it into an outline. Because then it, that's kind of my place marker on the outline going, okay, well, this just happened. These are the key things that I just wrote. Now I'm going to go back and write again and see what happens. Whoa, you guys are running me out of things to talk about here. Um, let me see. I do have one more thing we can talk about. Um, settings. I have, on the advice of somebody way back when, most of my books are set in the US, except for one series. And that is actually, I don't know if it's here, um, My Sugar with Mysteries. Audra Clemens has a little craft, sh craft shop in a place called Sugarwood, Ontario. I made it up, don't look for it. <laughs> And it was one of those books I actually did for NaNoWriMo. And I don't know if anybody knows what NaNoWriMo is. National Novel Writing Month started in California, actually, and now it has kind of spread like wildfire across the globe. Every November, authors challenge themselves to write 50,000 words in 30 days. Yeah. <laughs> now we know why there's that stereotype. Writers are a little... Um, it can be done. I have done it. And Audra was my proof, wherever she is. Um, I have written three books doing NaNoWriMo, so it, and it is fun, it is a challenge because it's one of those, like Charlie said, you sit down and you just start writing and you try and get in as many words per day as you can. You kind of have a ballpark of about, uh, 1350 per day, I believe it is, or 1330 per day if you write every day, but sometimes you can't, so you write like 5,000 words on a weekend or something. But it is a great challenge. Like if you want to see how far you can push yourself, NaNoWriMo would be a fun thing to do. And that is where I wrote um, The Sugarwood Mysteries, Drop Dead Cowboy is the name of the book. And I had a lot of fun with it because it was just constant writing. It was all in order. <laughs> which is unusual for me. It was all in order, a lot of writing, but I really loved the story. I had a lot of fun doing it. And now I'm actually working on ideas for book two for this year's NaNoWriMo. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Are you going to write anything besides closing the streets? Ooh, I have actually written a couple of fantasy novels that are sitting on the shelf still because I've been doing other things this year. Um, two or three fantasy novels and I have my, um, my writing book that we are working on right now. I don't know when that one will come out, <laughs> but um, it is in the works and it, we're having a lot of fun writing it, so. Will this be all detailed in your website when it's out? Oh yeah, yeah, everything will come on my website. It's just dianebader.ca. Tried to make it really simple this time. It was, I had a lot of fun making that website too. <laughs> and I don't know if anybody's checked out the 20 seconds of peace. If you click on the one bar, you, it, you go to a YouTube channel and it's all these little videos that I've been taking over the last year. And it's like 20 seconds of water running or the rain or the duck on the lake, <laughs> all kinds of fun, silly things, right? But just a little bit of normal in the world. 
Um, I want to thank you so much, Diane, yeah. for doing our first in-person program in a long time. It was wonderful. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you.